Good afternoon, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants will be on a listen-only mode. During the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, please press the star 1. This conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. At this time, I'd like to introduce your host for the call. Ms. Jared Lee Yoon may begin. Thanks very much, and thanks everyone who's joining us. This is the Brown Bag Lunch Series. It's a monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience to model organizations, methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for about 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. Today's session is approved by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF for one CFE Category 1. If you haven't already given me your certification number, you can email me after this session. Alternatively, most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which I can provide to uh, anyone who asks after this call as well. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees, and I encourage everyone who's on the call who uh, might not be a member to consider joining. I want to thank our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service for sponsoring this. Today's session is Neighborhoods Month 101. Neighborhoods Month is a national united campaign to celebrate trees and raise awareness for the value of urban forests. During October, tree groups across the U.S. will engage thousands of volunteers in stewardship, stewardship events and educational programs, communicating a shared message that trees are essential to the health and livability of communities. Last year, Neighborhoods Month staged 235 events in 62 cities engaging over 15,000 volunteers in hands-on service to care for city forests. Today's special webcast will explore how Neighborhoods Month can help you unite local efforts under a national banner to gain greater attention and leverage resources, and highlight this year's event tools and how to use them with your community partners to expand your city's celebration of Neighborhoods Month. Today's first speaker is Patrice Sheehan, Patrice administers the Street Tree Program for the City of Wilmington, coordinates annual Arbor Day activities, maintains a database of tree resources, and helps communities secure funding for tree program initiatives. Her favorite part of the job is working with volunteers planting trees. Patrice has worked as an ISA certified arborist for 12 years in New Jersey and Delaware. She is also certified by the ISA as a municipal specialist. Originally from Australia, Patrice now lives in Pittman, New Jersey, where she enjoys gardening, water gardening, camping, traveling, and serving on the Pittman Environmental Commission. She holds a BS in Business Administration with a specialization in management from Rowan University and an AAS in Ornamental Horticulture from Cumberland County College. And we turn it over to Patrice. Thanks, Jared. Um, this is Patrice. And, um, I'm happy to be telling you about uh, last year's Neighborhoods event. Um, in 2007, the Home Depot Foundation um, gave the Award for Excellence for Community Trees and Urban Forestry. Um, it was presented to Mayor James Baker at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, Wilmington uh, was the winner in the small city category. And uh, this $75,000 award has really enabled um, Trees for Wilmington, which is a working group of the Wilmington Beautification Commission, to improve the city's community forest resources. So in 2007, for our Neighborhoods event, we began with a news conference to announce this program. We invited the manager from a local Home Depot to present the award to Mayor James Baker and Pamela Sapko, who is our executive director at DCH, and she is also the chair of the Wilmington Beautification Commission. We invited developers, builders, and leaders from the community development organizations 
and partners like Habitat for Humanity, the Delaware Forest Service, to join us for luncheon and celebrate the occasion at our offices in Wilmington, Delaware. Naturally, we uh, included the ceremonial tree planting. And the luncheon was a great opportunity for developers to interact with city officials and members of the Trees for Wellington group. After lunch, the mayor welcomed the attendees to our greening round table. And the theme of Money Grows on Trees was started with a presentation about the benefits and values of trees and why, are, why they are economically important. The panel of speakers spoke about real estate values, economic development, stormwater issues, local resources, as well as national resources and issues relating to trees. We concluded by asking participants to sign a green compact. The compact recognizes trees as necessary for a healthy community through their benefits, aspires to maintain and expand our urban forests by protecting and planting trees, and commits to working together to promote a statewide urban forest strategy. Uh, we posted these compacts that were signed by all the participants, um, and we proudly added them to our bare tree limbs um, to show how symbolically uh, the tree was growing. We also gave away free tree seedlings to everyone, and we gave them a folder with uh, key tree information and resources that they could use. We also had other tree-related information available that they could take with them. And don't forget the t-shirts. But that was not the end of our neighborhood celebration. In the evening, we invited our neighborhood tree stewards for a celebration of all that had been accomplished that year, beginning with yet another tree planting. After we had pizza, our AmeriCorps VISTA worker, Andrew Mosier, gave the year in review and um, told all of our tree stewards what we had accomplished this year. We played Neighborhoods Bingo, and uh, that encouraged everyone to mingle and get to know each other and snack on tree products that we had donated. We also presented our Tree Steward of the Year Award. This has become an annual tradition, um, as well as acknowledging all the tree stewards who had applied for grants from the Delaware Community and Urban Forestry Council that year. The tree stewards also added their compacts to the ones that had been posted earlier in the day, and they also went home with their own tree seedlings. For neighborhoods, neighborhoods this year, we are planning a forum inviting the city council members, the mayor's office, as well as all of our tree stewards and Trees for Wilmington members to present the results of the U4 study that has recently been completed and kick off a campaign to increase Wilmington's tree canopy. We will again be sharing a light meal and present awards to tree stewards. We're going to listen to some songs from a local jazz singer who is also a tree steward, and send everyone home with tree seedlings and t-shirts. DCH is grateful for the support of ACT and the Home Depot Foundation, which has really enabled us to forge ahead with our urban forestry plan. And it has been very helpful to use the banners, logos, t-shirts, and the funding to help engage a really wide range of people from the community. Great. Thanks, Patrice. You're welcome. And if the operator can open the lines for questions, please. Okay. 
Thank you. At this time, we're going to begin a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 and record your name. To withdraw your questions, press star 2. Once again, please press star 1 and record your name if you have a question. One moment, please. And there are two ways to ask questions. You can do as the operator had just mentioned and ask your question yourself over the phone. Or if you're feeling shy or um, just more inclined to type your question, you can punch it into the Q&A section. Um, it's one of the tabs up top. And I'll, I'll, I'll come online and read the question for you. But I wanted to start by um, mentioning, just because this is sort of what we do at the Alliance for Community Trees, the, the levels of leverage that, um, or some of the levels of leverage that we see in the event. Um, I, I was out at uh, the Green Print Forum in Sacramento that Sacramento Tree Foundation is doing, and Andrea Mosier, the this intern, you know, that was something that she had picked up from that was about getting getting these people in the room who really can make a difference locally and having them sign on to a compact. And I just thought it was so neat uh, that she had taken it just months after that session and integrated that into this format. Um, you know, and it's it's how things work within the network is you see a good idea somewhere else and you incorporate it into your own. Um, and and then building on that, Salt Lake City, uh, Tree Utah in Salt Lake City. They had done a similar thing to what Delaware Center for Horticulture had done, um, just because the idea was there. You know, I mentioned, oh, they did this great event where they brought developers in and had the mayor there, and you know, they're really key players in the room, and uh, had them sign on to this compact. And it was a great way to engage this community that um, is otherwise sometimes at odds with with the tree program. So I just wanted to to mention that as well. Um, but I want to start by asking questions to Patrice. How did this event change your relationship or uh, build, how did you build on the relationship with developers specifically? Because we hear lots of stories from member groups around the country who would like to work closer with their developers or um, you know, find that that's a community that doesn't always engage in quite the way that they want. And I thought this was a great way to bring them in on a really positive note. Well, I think it's kind of a beginning point to open up the lines of communication and let them know what resources are available. And, um, you know, depending on where the housing construction is going on in the city, we, we have gotten response from some of the builders um, to utilize the funding that we may already have in place uh, through the Community Development Block Grant to plant new trees um, along, you know, street trees uh, that they didn't have to pay for. We, you know, we got the funding to get it done, and it's always nice to get them done before the new homeowners move in so that there's no question about what type of tree is there and, um, you know, whether or not there's a tree. It's, it's a great way to get, get new trees in. Okay. And do you have thoughts on um – what, what was the particular attraction for the developers who didn't show up and maybe thoughts on um, what might change in the future to get other developers who didn't come to uh, be part of the discussion? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think that it's just a matter of getting the word out and, um, you know, letting people know what resources are available to them. And the ones who did show up, what was particularly attractive to them? Uh, the free lunch. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it helps them to understand, too, that this, this is a kind of a movement that's going on, and we all are um, trying to improve the environment, trying to improve the urban heat island, um, you know, trying to make cities more livable. I mean, we were all kind of aiming for that, and we can be partners in doing this. Okay. Well, that saves, saves me from having to ask a loaded question about the food and <laughs> dad band and the T-shirts and whether they really help. Um, but that's something that I will mention later on, on the call, uh, some of the resources that the Alliance for Community Trees does help with, um, you know, whether it's a mini grant to help with food or T-shirts that we can send, um, you know, because we are trying to help everyone um, with the national branding or the national and local branding so people get the idea that, you know, you're doing something local, but it's also part of something national. And then, of course, food always helps bring them to the table. Right. 
All right. Does the operator have any questions? There are no questions at this time. All right. Um, it, is there anything you can tell us, Patrice, about um, how relationships with anyone who had been in the room, whether it was the city planning department or the public works or specific developers, how relationships have continued to build with any of those parties? Well, I think we have improved relationships with um, departments in the city, um, public works specifically, because we want to continue to, you know, reinforce the importance of trees as a utility in the city, um, not just an obstacle. <laughs> and so I, I think we are making some headway with that. and. Um, I think when they see also the community involvement in events that we do have, they they realize from a political level that, that it's important, too. Right. Okay, great. Um, well, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, the other thing, actually, I, I did want to mention about what Patrice had said. For anyone who doesn't know what U4 is, um, although I, I think you know, for the most part a lot of the people on, um, in this audience do, we did actually have a webcast uh, a couple months ago. I think we called it Trees, Trees and Technology or Technology in the Urban Forest, but it's, uh, it's posted up on our website. And uh, Scott Macko from the Forest Service, or he's with Davey now, uh, gave a presentation on U4 and some of the other tools that are available for use in the urban forest. But it's a great tool. Um, many of the things out there are free for the community, and it's fantastic to hear that uh, Delaware Center for Horticulture is uh, moving ahead with those things. So thanks very much, Patrice. You're welcome. And um, if you do have a question for Patrice, we will open the lines again later for questions and answers. But we'll move on now. Is Claudia still on the line? I am. Great. And I'm actually in and I can see everything, so that's great. All right, fantastic. Well, let me introduce Claudia to everyone. Claudia Schenk is a native of Germany and has been living in Nashville for 13 years. She attended Belmont University and graduated with a BA in English and Business Administration. After working in the banking and insurance industry, she joined the Tennessee Environmental Council as the office director in June of 2004. Claudia has been involved in several programs for the council, such as the Nashville Earth Day Festival, 2005 to 2008, chair of the 2007 Nashville Earth Day Festival, and Neighborwoods. She also manages all council events, fundraisers, and the volunteer program. She is currently working on the second annual summit for a sustainable Tennessee in November in Nashville. The URL for that is www.sustainabletn.org. That's an effort to create a sustainable future for Tennessee. She lives in Nashville with her husband, daughter, cats, and dogs. And we turn it over to Claudia. Okay, thank you, Jared. Um, uh, can you, since I just joined this, how does this work on, on going on to the next slide? Do I do that or? You can do that, yeah, with, there's a blue arrow at the bottom left. At the bottom, okay, okay. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, we found out uh, about the Neighborhoods Project, I believe, um, 48 hours before the grant was due last year. And uh, one of our uh, employees burned the midnight oil and, um, supplied the grant and we were very excited to have it. Uh, we have been trying to work with um, several organizations in general in, in the Nashville area and when we decided to uh, select our partners, we of course had the Alliance for Community Tr Trees who uh, enabled us to do this project and then we um, also partnered with the Home Depot Foundation with the National Area Habitat for Humanity and the National Civic Design Center and uh, several local arborists and a couple of landscaping companies also got involved in the planning process. Um, we, uh, we decided to um, partner with National Area, Area Habitat for Humanity because they have ongoing projects and they have um, set their focus for building on energy efficiency and uh, educating people about uh, the benefits of insulating your home or saving water. And so we, we thought that the uh, uh, tree planting trees and, and trees providing shade for their homes would tie right into that project. So we, uh, um, we selected the uh, project site uh, called Providence Park, which to that 
at that time, and I think until last week, was the largest and most ambitious uh, project they had with with 135 households, I believe. They just bought the largest ever property a, a week ago or so, so this is kind of outdated. I'm sorry. Um, there were no trees on the property when we uh, when we surveyed it, and um, we uh, we explained that the benefits of trees would tie right into what they're trying to do there with uh, you know insulating their homes really well and, and installing low flow showers and, and toilets and things of that nature. Um, so they were all built using pretty strict energy efficiency codes, and um, uh, the planning process involved uh, these um, these five components. The design was done by the National Civic Design Center. We actually had uh, had them do the layout, and uh, volunteers uh, were mostly coordinated by Habitat for Humanity and uh, the Tennessee Environmental Council. Of course, Habitat for Humanity has a vast uh, amount of volunteers at their hands, so we thought it would would make sense to use some of theirs um, to help with the project. Um, the tools we uh, were able to buy with a grant from the Home Depot Foundation, they also provided the uh, Home Depot aprons and and, uh, and other things, and then we were able to use some of the additional tools from the Habitat for Humanity because they were just finishing up the project. Uh, and the trees we uh, purchased um, through local arborists and landscape architects who uh, also selected, helped us select the trees to see which ones would work best and transported them to the site. And here you see a picture of the um, uh, opening ceremony. These are some of the families that uh, received the keys to their homes that day. Um, this was actually a couple of weekends before, before the planting. Um, we had scheduled a training session, um, which you can see here. That happened before we uh, we planned it, obviously. Um, so we had scheduled one training session, and then we had two weekends of planting scheduled, uh, Saturday and Sunday, two, two weekends right on top of each other. Um, staff hours that we uh, worked where the National Area Habitat for Humanity uh, put in 240 hours. Um, Civic Design Center and the design process, and they also participated in the planting, uh, 44, 45 hours, and the council 180. Uh, here you can see one of our fabulous uh, arborist volunteers who helped. He, he gave a, a detailed instructions on what to do and what not to do with the tools and with the trees. So we ended up planting 100, and, 100 residential trees. Um, and ended up maintaining some of them. There were there were not no trees on the properties of people, but there were some around the the area of the of Providence Park uh, that were not in people's yards. So we helped uh, maintain those, mulch, prune, and water them. And so all in all, a total of 100 trees, 150 trees, was either planted or cared for uh, in those two weekends. Um, after the planting, uh, we went through to look at which trees had made it and which ones were uh, would need to be replaced. So, of the of the hundred residential plate trees that we planted, we identified ten that probably would have to be replaced. A couple of them had been uh, abused, I'm going to call it, and then the rest was probably not watered properly. We also had a bad drought uh, last year, so. And through the winter, it didn't rain very much, so that all that uh, contributed. Uh, we planted 50 trees on a berm to help with noise reduction from the interstate because the project is located right alongside the uh, interstate. And uh, 12 of those will have to be replaced as well. Um, a summary of the volunteer hours, you can, you can see that on here. Home Depot um, actually brought a representative down here, and then we had several store employees that came and helped, uh, and a lot of students and uh, from people from schools and churches came, and those were mostly recruited by Habitat for Humanity. And then we had a bunch of other participants, such as council volunteers and council staff, and and uh, just random random people. Um, 
We had four days of planting scheduled, as I mentioned earlier, but we were able to complete it on uh, on three days. So we had one full weekend and then uh, the next Saturday because there were so many volunteers that wanted to help and get involved that we just got it done a lot quicker. So we were able to cancel that Sunday, that second Sunday we had originally scheduled. Um, and then, of course, the materials that were provided were really great because we were able to furnish these little bags of uh, informational materials and, and hand them out to the neighbors. Um, so they included, of course, the door hangers. And then we had posters and T-shirts um, for volunteers. And we had um, the benefits of trees. And we had uh, coloring books from the Home Depot Foundation. Um, so that was all uh, very well received, and people seem to be really happy about getting getting more background information. Um, and this is um, this slide uh, tells you about the socioeconomic indicators. It is, um, and, and this is just from the reporting form that we plugged in. But uh, based on the numbers that we entered, the funding that we received, and the trees planted, uh, and the households served, this is what uh, what came up um, as the. Uh, the benefits, so you can see for yourself, it's it's pretty amazing the um, the benefits trees provide, and so what we were able, the impact we were able to have just with that relatively small property um, on the grand scheme of things. Um, we have scheduled, we are, we are actually still in touch with that National Area Habitat for Humanity, and continue to do so. We're working on ideas of getting involved in their future projects and we we go back to the site probably every other month to check on trees and so we have just determined that due to the trees dying and needing to be replaced that we will have another follow-up planting on October 18th where we will um, replace everything that has not made it over the winter and the summer and then there's a, a large playground that is completely out in the sun and we we are going to work on planting shade trees uh, to protect the uh, the children playing in the sun and also to protect the equipment. And uh, this is a picture of the berm planting. To your left is the interstate. And uh, this is where most of the trees were that did not survive. And um, we were not quite sure what the reason was. It could be it could have been the drought. It could have been a poor choice of trees or just the uh, the fact that this berm was created and, and it's probably not the best soil underneath. So this, um, they will be replaced with na uh, native cedar trees that we're going to harvest from a local farm. And uh, we are told that the uh, cedar trees have a higher chance of survival than the ones that we had originally planted. And uh, we're just really grateful that we had the opportunity to do this and, and be pre uh, present out in the uh, in the community, and uh, we want to thank uh, uh, the Alliance for Community Trees for enabling us to do this. Great, thanks, Claudia. If uh, the operator can open the lines for questions, please. All right, thank you. And once again, if you have a question, please press star one and record your name. Star two to withdraw your question. Great, and again, you can. Uh, star one to ask over a phone, or you can type in your question online. And I want to start by um, mentioning one thing that I, I think Tennessee Environmental Council did a really strong job of that uh, maybe Claudia was too bashful to go into, and that's sort of the angle of pitching the story and, and, and getting media attention. Um, there were several things in this that uh, I, I think they did a great job with, and some of it originates from the partnership with Habitat for Humanity, but you know, hitting on some of the things she mentioned, like you know, at the time this was the largest all Habitat for Humanity development, I think in in North America or the U.S. Um, but you know, those sort of superlatives really grab media attention. Um, talking about how it was a really green, uh, affordable housing development, while you know, semi-separate from the issue of trees, you know, it's. It, it's it's all advancing the same field together, and people really, I, I think media were really latching onto that because the public has you know, obviously been very engaged in the green discussion. So those sorts of things, um, thinking about what's news to them, really makes a difference. Um, after after the event, I had uh, spoken with uh, the Tennessee Environmental Council and Habitat for Humanity, and they had also relayed several personal stories to me 
which I thought was really clever. Um, a lot of times we're out there talking about the number of trees we plant and how to, um, how to maintain them or what the benefits of trees were. And, and they did a really good job of putting it on a personal level. So, you know, they're telling me one story of a gentleman who had uh, gone through hurricanes, Katrina and Rita, in New Orleans, and tree fell on his house, and he decided, you know, that was it. Um, you know, he still loves trees. You know, it was the the trees weren't weren't the uh, negative part of the story, but you know, just he didn't want to rebuild New Orleans, and he moved up to Nashville, and got involved with Habitat for Humanity, and he's part of this development complex, and he was a real advocate for making sure that trees went in his property, despite what had happened in New Orleans. You know, he really um, bought into the benefits of trees. Um, long story short, short he's you know, been so active he's gone on. Now he's on the board of directors of Habitat for Humanity in the national area. Um, but just, you know, success stories like that, I think when it's put on the personal level of people who really um, buy in, volunteers who are part of this story, uh, it, it really spins this, you know, how, how this is local and national at the same time. But I think Claudia did a great job of also highlighting the socioeconomic factors that a lot of us use, and, you know, the media still um, it, it really does grab their attention because we are making a difference in terms of energy efficiency and stormwater management and noise pollution uh, in this case. Um, so definitely keep hammering away on those numbers, and kudos to the Tennessee Environmental Council. Thank you. I wanted to start um, by asking a question about Habitat for Humanity because a lot of our groups do work with Habitat. I think a lot of them um, who do work with Habitat would like a stronger relationship with them. Mm -hmm. There are many groups who don't work with them and would like to. Do you have any tips for those groups on uh, initiating a partnership with them or what makes those partnerships work? I think if you come to them with a clear idea of what you're going to do for them rather than asking them what they can do for you, um, that, that has helped because they are so incredibly busy, especially in the fall. And, uh, you know, I, with the uh, with the new planting schedule for October 18th, when I got in touch with them, they were saying that they're working on this, their biggest build time and they're working on these other big projects now. And, and so they will help. They will always, it seems like they will always do their part, but you have to really be prepared to do work, too. And they help you with the exposure and they make sure that people know about it. But it's, um, I think they were, they were glad that we had, you know, we brought the funding with us and that we brought the ideas with us and that we were doing the design and, it, and that it tied into what they were doing at the time. So it, it all kind of, I don't want to say we catered to them because we didn't, but it certainly seemed to align with their process. Right. And, and I think a lot of us see this where um, either trees are first on the chopping block when budgets get tight or they're not um, fully thought out in the planning process. Have you seen something now on the back end where, at least with Habitat for Humanity, it's something that's more integral to their mission? I have not. Okay. I have not. But I know that it's, uh, you know, they were very supportive in the fact that they mentioned the uh, trees for the uh, for the playground. That seems, you know, it seems like they're thinking in those terms now more than they did before. But I haven't, you know, I haven't been – I haven't talked to them about previous projects from a few years ago, um, but I would assume that based on the fact that they had built these houses with all this new insulation and, you know, really tried to make these homes as energy efficient as possible, that there is a, a change of, um, of conscience going on. Okay, great. We have a question online. Was this project already planned out before the grant was received from ACT? If so, what changed once the grant? once the additional support was granted? You know, that is a that is a good question. I may not be able to answer perfectly because I wasn't involved in the grant process. I was more involved in, in the carrying out and follow up after after the fact. Um, but I do know that it was um, that the idea was laid out and like I said we had two days when we when we heard of this we had two days to finish the grant. And um the partners and the ideas were laid out beforehand, um, but then I think the actual how how things were going to be actually done and who was going to do what that all was laid out later on. Okay, and and from my end, I don't have a firm um, memory on that. Um, 
we, we don't I don't think I don't it may have been the details of how things would be done but the general concept stayed the same. We were we were trying to go into the you know lower lower income uh uh in in an area with lower income households and work with them rather than go somewhere where it's not really needed. We really wanted to have an impact on on people where you know that it would provide several benefits, not just shade or but it would also uh provide a you know a, not a cosmetic effect but you know what i'm saying it would it would be nice for people to go outside and and help help contribute even to an even greater sense of uh pride of ownership because that's what they those people had as their first house and they had an incredible uh sense of ownership and they really wanted to make it great and they were so appreciative of someone coming coming to help them make their house and their yard even more beautiful and, and, and I'll draw a distinction too between uh, the neighborhoods grant and the neighborhoods month because um, this kind of blurs the line uh, since a lot of it did happen during neighborhoods month. Mm -hmm. But the neighborhoods grant is uh, something that is a year-long project for most organizations. In this case, I think it was wrapped up in the span of a few months, um, not including ongoing care of the trees. Yeah, yeah. But um, neighborhoods grant, you know, the, there are no necessary requirements for. Uh, funding before project or vice versa, but for Neighborhoods Month, the idea is that it would be a project that a group is already doing, and we offer these resources to help you make it bigger and brighter, so to say. Yeah. Well, tree plantings or, yeah, planting trees, that's an ongoing thing. You know, we plant trees all over the place, but we really wanted to branch out in, in some more, um, you know, areas where we could have a bigger impact. Right. Um, how long did the process take from planning to implementation? Uh, well, if you think about when was the deadline for the grant? That was in September? Um, it would have been well, awarded August. Or so probably the deadline was back in June or July. Okay. So so we had we did not have much time. We probably had a couple of months I would I would think. So it was um it was a lot of work and a lot of fun, but it was it had to happen quick. All right. Okay. Does the operator have any questions? There are no questions at this time. Okay. Um, well, uh, those are the questions that we had online. And uh, if you still have questions, you can um, keep on typing those in. But I will move on to talking a little bit more about Neighborhoods Month. And, and thank you, Claudia. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the resources we have for Neighborhoods Month. Um, <clears throat> and I'll start with the website, which should be the central repository for anything you're looking for um, to register your event, to see what events are already registered on the calendar, um, to apply for a mini grant, to get the online uh, web banners and ribbons, whatever it might be. Hopefully it's all out there on the website. So www.neighborhoodsmonth.org is the site. Um, and head on out there. We're uh, continually making updates to it. So if you go back next week, you might see slight differences as well. Um, the next slide shows some of the resources that we offer. And I'll pause here for a minute. We are wrapping up the final edits of the planning kit. And it should be available electronically within uh, probably within the next week, and then members will also get a, a hard copy mailed to them. But this is uh, it's sort of the crux of planning a neighborhoods month event. And if you've done it before, it's um, maybe more second nature to you. But it has tips on how to work with the media. It has sample press releases if, uh, with in a template that you can alter in Word, but also gives it a nice polished finish. It has neighborhood logos on it, so um, the media knows it's part of a national campaign, and also places for you to put your logo on it, so it, it's more meaningful to them because really they cover local events. Um, it has uh, other tips on how to work with the media and how to pitch stories to them. It has tips on what might make partners more interested in working with you. Um, has promotion tools, talks about things like uh, the photo contest and giving awards to your volunteers, um, and, and in general, you know, how to plan and carry out your event. Like I said, if you've done a neighborhoods month event or, you know, 
I think a lot of people on this call do, uh, do a lot of community organizing, obviously. So a lot of it might be second nature to you. So um, some of it is, is also taking that knowledge and tailoring, tailoring it specifically to how to host a local event that you would already be doing within the context of a national uh, service campaign. So that'll be going out soon. We have a mini grant to support uh, Neighborhoods Month events. The mini grant is available only to members, um, but anyone can join at any time. And the mini grant is up to $500. The idea is that it goes towards supporting something that you wouldn't otherwise put money towards, which basically boils down to it's not for plant materials, uh, staff time, or operational expenses, or organizational operational things. Um, so something to make your event bigger and brighter that you might not otherwise spend money on, like um, floating something on the news wire, or ordering extra t-shirts, or getting food for volunteers. We had someone who hired a babysitter once, or I can't remember if it was a babysitter or a clown, um, but something to entertain or to mind the children because they were dealing with bald and burlap trees, which was kind of dangerous in their environment for the small children. So it was the way that parents could be involved while knowing that their kids were well taken care of. We do offer kids activity cards. Last year, uh, the Million Tree Program in Denver ordered several thousand kids activity cards um, through the mini grant and other resources that we offered in order to use them in every public school in the city of Denver. Wow. So yeah, so things like that, um, you know, think big, think, uh, you know, something that, you know, would help you make your event a little bit bigger and brighter, and we definitely would like to help support that. We have a special t-shirt grant this year. We've ordered lots and lots of t-shirts um, and have left plenty of space for you to be able to take the t-shirt to your local vendor to screen print your logo on it. So um, again, it has that local and national feel to it. The t-shirt that's up on the website, I, I, I didn't, or on, on your screen, is not the actually updated shirt. That's the one from last year. But this year's shirt is out at neighborhoodsmonth.org, so you can check that out. It basically looks the same. Um, there are slight differences because um, the idea is we're trying to brand something as Neighborhoods Month, so it would still be recognized by anyone who knew, knew Neighborhoods Month from last year, but also know that it has kind of a fresh look to it. So that's out there, and through the T-shirt grant, you can order uh, 25 additional T-shirts. Um, so we have... You can have four T-shirts just for hosting an event, and then 25 shirts for applying for the T-shirt grant. We have, uh, we'll help you with media outreach, and, and all of this is tied to registering your event. Um, we can't help if we don't know what your event in October is. So register your event. Um, but once we know what your event is, and if, uh, if we don't have the basic details, I'll follow up with you, but what your event is, when it is, what time to what time, what location specifically, um, so media knows where to show up and what time that someone will be there to um, talk with them. You can add details like the mayor will be there um, or, you know, there will be a photo session or um, our communications person will be available to press at this time specifically. Or maybe you ask certain distinguished members of the community to be there just for a half an hour time block and that's consist or in that, and that's, you know, you've locked them down to that, to that that's the time you really push for media, and the rest of the time um, you're pushing for volunteers. But you know, nailing down those basic details, if you let us know what they are, we'll help you with media outreach. We send things to national and local media. We'll help you put it into the neighborhood's uh, press release and media advisory templates, and uh, we'll post it out on our website. And, and that's something you can refer people to as well. Um, maybe you don't have a website, maybe um, being part of uh, and pointing people to the national website is of value to you, but it'll be out in our newsroom, it'll be out in the calendar events on neighborhoodsmonth.org, so uh, we can definitely help out on that. This year we have a few focus events, um, and, and, and these two events that presented today were focus events from last year. <coughs> this year we have focus events in other cities like Tucson and Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, uh, Los Angeles. So uh, they're happening all around the country as well. And uh, while the focus events are locked in for this year, if you're interested in being a focus event next year, 
let us know that. Um, there are extra resources that we um, will help out with for, for focus events and, and just help you brand it even more so uh, as, as part of that national campaign. Um, we have a photo contest. And last year it was won by the Greening of Detroit. And we give a $500 gift card to the Home Depot for um, the winning entry. General scheme of it is showing the, the spirit of volunteerism through Neighborhoods Month. Um, there are details out on the website, but um, yeah, submit your photos. I'll, I'll take as many photos as you want, email them to me, load them up to our Flickr site. Um, but I, I, I bet there are many photos out there already that show just that, the spirit of volunteerism through Neighborhoods Month, and it could be worth $500. We have um, an awards contest. I think we're launching pretty soon a Volunteer of the Year Award, so you can recognize your local uh, stellar volunteer uh, who could win uh, a National Volunteer of the Year Award. And we also have lots of resources for you. Um, there are a couple of them on your screen right now. The online banner is something that you can slap up onto your website. Um, there are some that move and some that don't, depending on what you like. Um, we have Facebook and MySpace accounts if, uh, if you're looking to engage you know, that tween to 20 crowd. Um, that's something that you can link up with. Uh, it's a great way. I know that Indianapolis, uh, Keep Indianapolis Beautiful out, out there in Indiana, uses that as how they notify people of what events are going on. They've got all of their friends loaded up into there, and they send out the blast every time that something's coming up. And, and that's how those people want to communicate with them. So, um, you know, it's 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 just how they're, they're tapped in, so it offers accessibility. Um, some of the other resources we have there are up on your screen. There's the door hanger and the gift poster, kids' activity cards we went into. The door hanger, I'll go back to actually. We, uh, we send those out on sheets of paper that are 8.5 by 11, so they can load right into your printer, and the back side is blank. And the idea there is that you can print up your logo on them, your local information, um, maybe how to care for the tree that you just installed, and then there's a perforation so you can divide them into two door hangers and that middle section comes out so it goes right on the door. Um, so we, uh, we try to think of resources that are of value to local community organizers and that they can tailor to their needs. I've got a couple examples here. There's Keep Indianapolis Beautiful's website with one of the web banners on up on there. Parks and People Foundation put the Neighborhoods Month logo on their website. We have a ribbon, um, and I don't have any pictures of what that looks like on the website because it's a JavaScript and it doesn't come through on a PDF. But it's an, another way that you can just put a, um, just a small uh, graphic image through the upper corner of your website and you know grabs attention but doesn't take up any additional space, and you can take it off after Neighborhoods Month is over. Let's see. Oh, I did grab one. Perfect. I guess that one comes through. So the, the one on the right, you can see there's one of the, the ribbons in the upper right corner um, for Valley Proud Environmental Council site. And then <coughs> Tree Davis put a couple logos up on their website as well. And for anyone who does get the, the mini grants, there, there, are, uh, there are some logos for you to slap up special for that. So uh, just to give you... Uh, the perspective of what the national campaign has achieved, uh, you can see the blue is two years ago, the red um, one year ago, and then the yellow is last year, how uh, Neighborhoods Month has really taken off. Um, it's, it's a young campaign, obviously, started in 2005, but it was something that the urban forestry crowd was asking for, and specific, specifically our members. They wanted a campaign that was all theirs, that they could brand as theirs, and that's the idea of what Neighborhoods Month can be for you. So it should be an event that you're already organizing and that we can help, again, brand um, with a national flavor to it. But you can see last year we had 225 events, 35,000 volunteer hours. Um, we were in 62 cities. So it's really taking off, and I'm excited to see what it will be this year. So please register your events, neighborhoodsmonth.org. Um, going into the socioeconomic factors, uh, I, I think this, for me, this hammers home the message of these are events that are happening already. 
locally you're making a huge difference, and Neighborhoods Month is just a time when we all push together. And when we pull together our accomplishments um, as one group, we can see that we're really making some dramatic changes out there. Um, the millions of gallons of stormwater management captured uh, from the trees that we're planting just in that one month, and, and you know, these are annual numbers, so every, every year we're going to capture that much stormwater. We're going to capture that many tons of air pollutants, and um, there are um, there are applications here too, as far as how many dollars are saved or estimations based on very solid research. You know, for how much it costs to uh, capture that stormwater or clean those air pollutants. Um, so, if that's what your mayor grabs onto, or that's what the media grabs onto, you can talk specifically about the dollars that they're saving through those things or energy. Um, whatever it might be. But you can see, again, we're making huge impacts. Um, and then this is just what we've, uh, what we've sent out internally um, to help support neighborhoods. So you can see that some of the things are uh, you know, of huge value to people, um, the grants, obviously, the kids' cards, the door hangers, the posters. People really uh, take great advantage of those. The tool belts, we always hear fantastic stories back. Um, how volunteers just dig the tool belts. That gives them a place to put their kids' activity cards or their tools, uh, their hand tools, whatever it might be. Um, but things have really taken off with the, the resources. And if there's something that you would like that we don't offer, let us know that too. I love that feedback. Um, in general, that's it. Um, that's Neighborhoods Month. I'm happy to take any questions you have uh, about the resources we offer or about Neighborhoods Month. Um, if, uh, if the operator can open the lines for one okay. last round of questions. All right, sir. And once again, if you have a question, please press star 1 and record your name. My mama, please. And again, you can type it in online. And I won't hold it out there for too long just because, um, like I said, you can follow up with me offline. But uh, hopefully this gives you a good idea of what Neighborhoods Month is and um, you know, a sense for how you can brand it both locally and nationally. All right, any questions from the operator? There are no questions at this time. Okay, perfect. Well, we will uh, we'll wrap it up there then. Uh, throwing up a, uh, a, a URL, if, if you can, if everyone can go out there and answer, I think there are four questions. It literally will take two minutes, maybe less, to answer those questions. It really helps us uh, to continue to develop these sessions. Otherwise, I want to thank our presenters, Patrice and Claudia, for uh, talking about their projects and doing such an able job of it. I want to thank our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Again, mention that if you need credit through the ISA or SAF or State Landscaping Board, you can email me afterwards if you haven't given me your registration number or you need a certificate of completion, and I can get that out for you. The next webcast is actually next week. It's uh, September 18th, and the session is Urban Forestry Partnerships in Education. But again, thanks to our presenters, all of the participants, and our sponsors. Thank you.